the ARF Wednesday lecture. Thank you for coming. Sorry about last week. Uh, the speaker who was going to come, I don't even know why, but couldn't come. Something came up. So he is speaking in two weeks, I believe. The 30. He was sick. Okay, sinus infection. That sounds painful. So uh, we're going to hear from him again soon. But today we're very, very lucky, and I'm thrilled to announce uh, Dr. Sarah Kanza, who hopefully all of you have met. Uh, at some point, she now works with and with ARF, all of us here, and you're probably going to interact with her on various different occasions. Uh, very important um, participant now. But she also uh, works for, she says open contacts, but I thought it was Alexandria. Oh, I'll explain that. Okay. <laughs> the Alexandria started in 07. She got her PhD from Edinburgh, uh, working on faunal, uh, rema faunal remains from in Turkey, and or Jordan, Turkey, um, and then has continued on now working in Italy. So she has worked in a series of projects and is, is very engaged in um, archaeozoology, uh, but also on, involved in open context and open research, open data access for people uh, of archaeological material for scholars to work with. So many things, and they come together in, I think, her title, Overcoming Specialist Silos, which is also very important for us as we want to try and blend and bring data together uh, to ask a more uh, interpretive and more nuanced questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and I hope that uh, you all enjoy her presentation very much and give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, thanks for having me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll just explain what um, I am now half time at ARF, and I also run a nonprofit organization, um, half time, which is called the Alexandria Archive Institute, which was founded in uh, 2001. And over the years, we ended up developing an open access data publishing system, which is called Open Context. And we recently actually melded the names together. So now Open Context is also the nonprofit organization. And so uh, it was just what was we were becoming known for more than this really wordy Alexandria Archive Institute, which isn't in Alexandria, and it was causing a lot of confusion. So anyway, I'm now promoting this sort of open context side of things. Um, so this is um, open context. The system itself was launched in 2006, and it's an independent nonprofit organization based here, actually, in Berkeley. And um, we originally got funding from the Hewlett Foundation to um, demonstrate how one might bring together data on the web. And this was back in 2003, when like Google was even just starting to become a thing. And so um, it was really early on, and Hewlett was funding open educational resources. And it was just, you know, whatever, by luck, we ended up going to them. And they were like, this is something that we would like to see done. And um, we'd like to see what you can do in terms of for bringing archaeological data together. Um, we had both, so we, I'm talking of Eric Kanza, who's my husband, is the co-founder of this, of this effort, and we've worked together now for 15 years on this. Um, we both got PhDs in anthropology and archaeology and um, had spent a lot of time, as you all have and will be doing, um, co collecting lots and lots of data to analyze for our dissertation research, and we were both really frustrated that at the end, most of that never saw the light of day. It got sort of summarized or whatever, but we were never able to share it. And um, being fresh out of grad school, we were like, maybe we should try to do something about this. And that's where the idea, the idea started for this open context thing that then was launched a few years later with help from Hewlett. Um, fortunately, we're now seeing increasing attention paid to sort of data archiving. Um, and so these efforts are getting supported more by different granting agencies. So we've expanded our support. Um, we're mostly grant funded. Increasingly, now we're getting funding from data management plans that people are writing into their grants, which is great. I think probably like 90% of what we publish in Open Context now is coming from um, the funded uh, grant uh, projects. Uh, we now, Open Context now has um, over 100 data publications, and I'm going to go through some examples of what data publications look like and our approach to publishing data. Um, and it, it includes over 1.5 million items, and again, I'll explain why there's so many. It's the, it has to do with the approach to sharing data that we take. Um, and this includes a whole lot of images and media, and part of that is because actually when we first started, it was like the days of Flickr, and we first started out thinking, ooh, wouldn't it be great if we did this thing where it could be all like crowdsourced and people could tag things and, and there could be a lot of images and everyone could share their stuff. And then we realized over time that 
people actually were more interested in having something that more looked was more like a formal publication and not so much of this sort of loose uh, data sharing, but actually um, something that looks more like something that you can actually share and maybe get counted towards your, your, your tenure and promotion and that kind of thing. So. Um, and so I'm going to start out this talk by giving you an, some examples of, of um, the data publications. We have an open context, and a lot of this is informed by my work as a zooarchaeologist. So um, if you go to open context, you'll see that there's a whole lot of zoarch data in it. Part of that is because zooarchaeology is um, a very sort of data-heavy field, um, and we collect lots of data that can actually have the potential to be integrated. And so it was a good um, sort of low-hanging fruit to start with. But it's also because I had a lot of connections in that area if I'm having worked into archaeology. And so um, I'm going to talk about what we've learned about data publishing from zooarchaeology, but then I'm also going to move on to talk about some zooarchaeological studies that have informed our understanding of data reuse um, after the data is published. Um, so just really briefly about open context. Again, it's been developed iteratively over 10 years, so we didn't build something that was static. It's something that we're trying to improve as we get feedback from people um, over the years. It, um, we really focus on linking out, so we try to link to other systems that are data sharing as well, because we realize that we can't do everything, so we're um, working on you know, doing our part well and then linking across to other systems that are <laughs> approaching data sharing in a different way so we can together start um, sharing data across the web. Um, everything is built in all open, um, open code, all the data is open, so we, we um, are careful about making sure that people can actually share the data that they're sharing. We can't do everything, so we are... Um, sort of picky about that, about what we publish, to clear it with everyone um, that it's okay that it's open access. Um, and we are, um, back in 20, I think 2011 and 2012, the NSF and then the NEH, the NSF Archaeology and NEH uh, Office of Digital Humanities, they both now list open, con open context as one of the suggested places that people might go to to, to fulfill their grant data management requirement. Um, we have actually, we archive with the California Digital Library here. Um, and then elsewhere across the world, we have mirroring at the German Archaeological Institute and other places in order to keep the data safe. And over the past few years, we've received um, a few awards in recognition of this work. And so this, is, this stuff is really starting to be sort of recognized more as um, important in our field. And so we got a digital curation award actually for a paper that we gave about some of this work. And the AIA gave us their um, outstanding work in, or outstanding contributions to digital archaeology award in 2016. And in 2013, actually, the um, Obama White House, the good White House, right, <laughs> um, recognized uh, Eric Kanza for his work in, um, as a champion of change in open science and had him go out there and um, talk, which was pretty awesome. We didn't get to meet President Obama, unfortunately. So um, obviously, so open context is involved with data, and data is a hot topic, and it's a subject of lots of investment in um, the world of government, business, and big science. And The Economist even recently said that it's um, the most important resource in the world now. But today I'm going to talk about how data fits rather awkwardly in our day-to-day -day practices in archaeology. I'll give a few overview about why data is often harder for us to deal with, and how with Open Context we're exploring ways to make data less awkward and more effective for archaeology. And then I'm also going to discuss my own work with zooarchaeology and coping with how to effectively share specialist data. So I'm going to discuss um, two main sides to this, the challenges associated with motivating good practices among data creators, and then the related challenges in encouraging data to be reused. So we're all familiar with the phrase publish or perish. Um, academic researchers are obviously under a lot of pressure to publish in the right venues with the right kind of impact. And the kinds of publications that count for getting a job um, from a promotion for tenure are all very limited. Of course, this leads to some per perverse incentives in archaeology. We're rewarded for certain kinds of publications, but these kinds of publications typically, typically present only a very tiny portion of the research documentation that we create. Since archaeological research, and especially excavation, can be destructive, we need to find ways to motivate our peers to be more comprehensive in sharing their research results. So motivating data sharing is, important, is an important issue for cultural heritage um, stewardship. This isn't just a problem in archaeology. Lots of other sciences have trouble motivating more comprehensive data sharing. In response to the Obama administration, um, in response, the Obama administration began requiring grant seekers to provide data management plans, as you, as you all know. This was a good first step, but it's not enough. Um, 
data management plans often don't get much attention, perhaps increasingly so. And the publisher parish pressures continue, so digital repositories tend to bend over backwards to make things easier for data creators, even if that creates long-term difficulty for data reusers. So the goal of most digital repositories is to make it as easy and as painless as possible for researchers to deposit content. That way they can keep costs down and not frighten away researchers who have other publication pressures. But the problem is that's sort of a garbage in, garbage out kind of issue, that if digital repositories only try to make things easier for depositors, reusers may suffer. Um, and we worked with a study called Dipper, led by our colleague Ishelle Faniel, who is uh, with OCLC, which is a library research group, and um, Elizabeth Yakel, who's a dean at University of Michigan iSchool. And this study explored some of these issues in reusing data stored in digital repositories. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that research a little later. So sorry for the vegetarians, but not surprisingly, metadata and data quality issues represent big challenges. A messy and poorly documented data set may require lots of work to fix, understand, and clean up for reuse. So to meet some of the incentive challenges, um, to not only share data, but also to uh, share understandable and clean data, we're exploring a model of data sharing as publication. We hope to encourage similar effort and rewards in the dissemination of data as in more conventional publication. We want researchers to invest effort in making good data, and we want researchers to see recognition and rewards for that effort. So this shows our sort of elaborated open context data publishing workflow where we have added these areas of documentation, review and editing, and annotation. And so we work with people's data sets to actually make sure that they are um, cleaned up and that they make sense and that they're, um, sort of they're annotated with things that can link them out to other data on the web to make them more useful for reusers. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how Open Context differs from most digital repositories. Um, so it extracts data from, con from contributed data sets and uses those extracted data to add um, to a single common big database. So in contrast, most repositories store uploaded databases as individual files described by some metadata. So there are, there are advantages and disadvantage to the, disadvantages to these two approaches. Um, open context approach is much more expensive and time consuming because we have, lots, we have to put lots of effort into da cleaning data, extracting data, and fixing problems in the data so it can be published online. In contrast, most um, repositories are more focused on metadata rather than on the content of the files. So in most repositories, in order to see what's inside a data set, you have to download the data set and open it up with the right software. However, because Open Context extracts data into a common big database, we do overall reduce some problems with complexity. Each contributed data set can be searched and queried through a common set of software tools and services, so you don't have to build a new system for each database. So I should also note that Open Context um, only has a common system of organizing data. Um, sorry. It, um, it, relate, it retains the data author's own system description so that each data set can have its own typology and descriptive information, et cetera. And so this is kind of initially more expensive because it um, puts a lot of work on the ingest, but in the end, it, it is cheaper because reusers aren't confused and not able to use a data set and they don't have to do all that kind of cleanup on the other end. So Open Context puts extracted data into a common database um, because um, so much relevant archaeological information is often scattered across many um, different data files in a given project. So here's a coin from Domus Tepe, which is a mostly Neolithic site in Turkey, but which had a um, late Roman coin hoard on part of the site. And the data about this coin came from four different data files. There was a relational database that um, stored the context information. There was a spreadsheet that stored the photo log. There was another relational database that stored thousands of small finds records that this was part of. And then there was another spreadsheet created by a numismatist with um, more specialized descriptions of the, of the coin. So basically the complete record of this coin was scattered across many data files. And Open Context Publishing Workflow brought all of this scattered information together into a more cohesive whole, which simplifies access and analysis. Rather than in a traditional archive, you'd have to go and download all four of those different things, find the coin across all those four different things, and piece it together that way. So it simplifies the, the research process in that way. So if you want to read more about these sort of comparisons, there's this um, somewhat dated article but from 2015, which is really clearly well-written um, by Beth Sheehan that um, compares um, 
in this case, TDAR and Open Context, but it's sort of a more generalized, um, more traditional archive with the Open Context approach. Um, so basically, in this data sharing is publishing um, setup, we have tried to make it like a publisher where we have editors and then we have an editorial board of, of experts who can review the different data sets to, for consistency and quality um, and that kind of thing. So we, they, we do go through a peer review process that, that makes sure that the data sets are, are sound. Um, and just a word on intellectual property. Um, you typically use data in somewhat different ways than you use text um, that you read. One important use of data is to combine different data sets from different sources. But in order to do that, you need to have legal permissions. Furthermore, open licensing simplifies preservation of data. With copyright permissions granted by open licenses, we can and we do archive data with multiple repositories in the US and overseas. Um, so all data publications in open context have um, open copyright licenses, which is usually the Creative Commons attribution license, which essentially gives explicit legal permission to use the data and media as long as you cite the creator. And we fully recognize that not all archeological content should be published this way. There can be ethical problems with open licenses, especially in context with histories of colonialism. So we explicitly ask that researcher, um, research engage in, the researchers engage in community archeology span so they can understand how to ethically participate in open access and open licensing. So now I'm gonna move on and give a few examples of publication types in open context. And so, other than adhering closely to our data publishing and intellectual property guidelines, we take a broad approach to what kinds of data we publish. So we realize you can't just build something and expect people to just you know, follow that model. So we don't require full excavation data sets. We realize that people have different motivations in sharing their data. And we've really tried to work with the data creators to meet their needs. And so in, for that reason, we have a whole sort of wide diversity of data publications in open context. And I'm just gonna show you, this is sort of our, are different types that we can cluster them into, and these types are increasing, actually, I'll mention at the, um, at the end of the talk. So the standalone publication is where an individual or team wants to put their entire project on the web as a standalone data publication, which basically they end up, they collect um, in the field, everything they collect in the field ends up in open context. And one example of this is the site where I work in Italy called Poggio Civitate Murlo, and um, they have, as you can see here, they've got all these different types of finds that, they've, that they're over time putting into, into open context and linking together. This is from 52 years of excavation, so it includes old field notes and things that were just on paper that they've over the years um, scanned and entered digitally into their um, infield database and then are putting in open context. Um, this is an example of a record of an ivory, an ivory object from Foggia Civitate, and it's linked to images, mapping data, context data, authorship, etc. So Open Context provides that common infrastructure for publishing and linking all of these different sorts of content within the project. Um, so on the bigger data side of things, we also have several projects that are multi-year efforts at integrating data across broad spatial or temporal ranges. Um, and so just an example of this is the DINA project, which is the Digital Index of North American Archaeology. And this is an ongoing, really big project with, um, it's funded by the NSF, and it's with colleagues at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Dave Anderson and Josh Wells, who's at Indiana University, South Bend. And um, we're basically working with the SHPOs, with the State Historic Preservation Offices, to get the site file data from every state put into this common infrastructure so that you can search across state boundaries and you can do sort of this bigger picture research across the US rather than having to go state to state to state to find that information. The idea is that um, everything is, um, the site locations are all approximated on a grid, for a 16 kilometer by 16 kilometer grid, so there's no site uh, locations released. They are linked through their Smithsonian trinomial number for site ID. And so the idea is that over time, open context, it's published in open context and then acts as sort of a gazetteer where each site has like a peg and resources from across the web that refer to those sites can all be found based on being linked to that Smithsonian trinomial number. And so it's hoping to improve access to information about all these sites from across the web over time. So this is a very long-term project. The um, dots in California are because we have a collaboration with the Hearst Museum where um, Hearst objects that have Smithsonian trinomials are plotted onto the, onto the map. And um, if you need to, you can find out that that's there, but then you have to go to Hearst to see the object for now. So 
it's sort of an example of how we might link museum objects with this system. And this, this DINA data has actually already been used in some um, interesting research where they used, um, uh, there was an exploration of sea level rise impacts um, on coastal archeological sites. And it got a lot of press because I think very few people realize just how many archeological sites there are in the US. And um, this is you know, tens of thousands of sites that are threatened by rising sea levels over time. So then we have, increasingly, we have people who are coming to us to um, help fulfill their, their grant data management plans. And this is one example of a PhD student at Harvard, Max Price, who had research on um, cementum um, analysis of pig teeth. And um, he just shared that data that was related to his PhD research. And so what's nice um, is you get your citation, which has a DOI for the project. But then every single item in the project has its own citation too. So every single pig tooth, every single fragment has its own web page that has a unique citation. So you can point specifically back to this item if you want to talk about it in another publication. You don't have to say, go to this archive, open the spreadsheet, look for bone number, whatever. You know, so it's, it's a much more, it's much more, the more disambiguated way of doing research. Also what's nice is each project in Open Context can have its own um, customized banner and look, so it kind of looks like your own web page. So Max um, actually had a colleague, uh, I think in Turkey, who did these watercolors, and he added those as his banner, which I thought was kind of nice. It adds a little bit of your own personal creativity to the site without being quite so um, clinical. This is uh, Lizzie Wright, who is in, based in the UK, and she did um, a biometrical database of, of aurochs and domestic cattle measurements. Um, for her PhD, and then what's fun is that you can search all of hers, but then you can also get all cattle measurements and, and wild cattle measurements from wherever else in open context there's actually data from, and ideally from elsewhere on the web too, eventually. We also support archival research. Um, this is showing a bunch of um, drawings, excavation, and conservation data about the Sphinx. Um, the monument is changing all the time, with, it has challenges with tourism and pollution, um, so this is a good way to help understand how the monument is changing over time. Um, this is part of ongoing publishing work that we're doing with Mark Lehner's group on publishing huge amounts of excavation data from the Giza Plateau. And the next data set is actually a paleobotany data set um, from excavation of one of the more domestic contexts at Giza by Claire Mallison. Um, so then we also um, have people who want to publish a data set that contains data that is related to a um, publication of theirs. So basically a smaller data set that they're um, linking to from, from a publication. And so this is an example of um, a publication that was in antiquity that um, put a link to the, the data set that was published in open context. And so readers can go back and they can look at the primary data set and then they can reproduce the, the claims made in the paper rather than just sharing like a summary data table. This is um, a larger volume that does a similar thing, but it's more like, a, uh, like an edited volume. So basically they have a print volume about archeology span of Mesoamerican animals and several of the chapters had data that they wanted to share. So in open context, we set it up also like an edited volume. There's a main page and then there's sub pages for all the chapters that have their data sets that, re that are related to chapters in the print volume. And then finally, we have um, supplement, um, supplementing monographs. And so when there's just too much data to put in print, um, this happened for the Petra Great Temple excavations, which just had a ton of images and, and data that couldn't make it into the, the um, monograph, the printed monograph. And so um, what we did was we published all the data in Open Conics, and then um, the data the creator, Martha Joukowsky, she asked for um, links to certain things that she wanted to refer to in the publication, and so we gave her a huge list of all these links, and she's now linked up her, her print publication to individual items, like these nice, these nice drawings and stuff that couldn't necessarily make it all into the volume. So another category is emerging, actually, where people are wanting to make these sort of um, community created um, databases where um, they sort of set up a page and then ask people to contribute certain things so that they can build out their data with their, with their community. So for example, we have this osteometric database of South American camelids. We have a new one now on Chinese petrography, which actually has instructions in English and Chinese, and people can download a spreadsheet that um, 
has it in both, and then you and then you enter your information and you submit it back in. So this is something that um, we're really interested to see how this pans out. It takes a lot longer because you're asking for lots and lots of people to share their data, and it takes a long time for people to get their data organized. Um, so for now, they just wait and uh, and get promoted in this way, and share things like downloadable spreadsheets for people to do data entry. Um, other ways that we've tried to address the need out there is by um, offering um, to do development when people can actually when people need something special. So for instance, this project had um, images that they wanted zoomable. Um, they wanted to be zoomable because they have a high, really high resolution and they have details that you can't see just in the, in, the, in the one image. And so they actually came up with extra funding to, so that Eric could build in a zoomable feature and now that's there and all other projects can use it because it's part of Open Context now. Um, and we also responded to a need for 3D models and so um, another project um, is doing a sort of a test to see how we might, we might link a print publication with the 3D models online. And they also came up with funding to build in this open source um, rendering for 3D, which allows you to change the lighting and do measurements and everything right there in Open Context. You don't have to download anything special to be able to look at it. So, and that's nice too, again, because other projects can use it now that it's built. So we're really trying to respond to the, the need out there and it makes it very diverse, but also um, pretty dynamic. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to the Zoark part. Um, so far, I focus, so far I've focused on the data creators and how we're trying to use a model of data sharing as publishing to encourage data creators to share more and better data. But for publishing to have an impact, the data needs to see actual reuse by a wider community. So now I'm gonna look at the challenges we face in reusing archeological data. And I'd like to focus on specialist data and describe issues in our current research practices and how to improve them so that data sharing and reuse can better contribute to our efforts to understand um, our, the archeological past. So I'm a zooarchaeologist and I have lots of expertise in this area. Um, I've worked not only in the Near East, but also actually here I had a project at Yerba Buena Island and um, in the East Coast of the US and also in Europe. Um, comparatively speaking, zooarchaeologists are often engaged in, mul in multi-site comparative research. And so we have a greater interest in sharing, reusing, and integrating mul multiple data sets. Um, and so to understand the intersection of data creation and reuse needs, we have, to under, um, we have undertaken several research projects over the past five years or so. Um, and this, what I'm gonna talk about is gonna range from my own reflections on personal experiences as a specialist, as a data publisher, and as a data reuser. And then I'll talk, um, uh, I'll move on to talk more about, uh, about a much more formalized study called the Secret Life of Data Project, which involves workplace ethnography and other qualitative research methods. So as I mentioned, as it turns out, zooarchaeology is sort of the low-hanging fruit for collecting information about this topic. Um, but zooarchaeologists in particular, and specialists in general, create use, very useful data that benefits the entire project, but their data often gets siloized um, and is never fully integrated into the interpretation of the project. And this is for many reasons, often because specialists are operating, they're working at very different timelines than the actual excavation. Um, we often use recording uh, methodologies and strategies that are different from the project or from other specialists. And again, yeah, we usually, we often create really useful data, but it just never makes its way back to the project. So um, I'm currently working at the site of Morlo, Poggio Civitate, which is um, in Italy, uh, just south of Siena. It's an amazing area, um, really fun place to work. And it's been excavated for more than 50 years um, with three different directors, the first of which was an art historian. And so as you, can as you can imagine, there's very different excavation strategies employed over the decades. And surprisingly, for an Etruscan site, they have like tens of thousands or even 100,000 bones that they recovered over this time. So it's actually an amazingly huge assemblage for, um, for this time period. Um, and so when I came into the project eight years ago, um, they just had boxes and boxes and bags and bags of, of bones from all these years that, and some were, you know, that big. I mean, 400 bones in one bag if from one context from 1972. And then now they're excavating and they're bringing these tiny little bags back per context. So, you know, three bones and stuff like that. So it's obviously there's very different, there's a comparison issue here 
with the different contexts. And that's something I, I um, was trying to find ways of dealing with. Um, surprisingly, there are actually some really great um, research results coming out, of this, coming out of this project. I work there every summer and I can only analyze in the field. So that is helping um, to be able to actually communicate with the project team um, about what's, what's happening. And because I'm analyzing the old stuff and the new stuff, some stuff is coming to light from what they found before that's, that's helping inform their excavation practices now. One of the issues is that we, from the old bones, um, we have found a whole bunch of n uh, newborn baby bones. And they had no idea that this was something that was, that was gonna be popping up. And so now they've sort of changed their excavation strategies to try to be a little more careful about um, excavating bones to try to get more understanding of where these baby bones are occurring um, because in the past they were just taken out with all the rest of the bones. Um, so the site is um, Etruscan. It's um, uh, um, mostly from the Orientalizing period, which is about 7th century BC um, and wasn't occupied for very long, like 100, 150 years. Um, and so we have basically remains from three different areas. The residents had um, a lot of remains that indicated that it was some kind of elite um, area. The tripartite building, we don't know what it was, and so it's a ritual area. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not well understood, and there's not a lot of material from there. The workshop is this huge workshop that has tons and tons of industrial uh, waste and, and remains, and so they were doing some kind of industrial activity there. And um, what I found is actually, amazingly, after even over 50 years of, of um, different types of excavation strategies, there are some differences across these different areas. And um, one is in the occurrence of wild animals. Um, so we have some pretty cool wild animals coming up, like wolf. There was even a, an aurochs uh, wild cow. There's lots and lots of wild boar, um, all sorts of other animals, um, in addition to the regular you know, pigs sheep and cattle that you get. And so anyway, but um, what we're seeing is that there are actually, there are differences in the occurrence of the, these wild animals at the site where there's sort of more scary, sort of formidable animals are occurring in the, in the residence. And the smaller animals um, are occurring in the workshop. Perhaps for pelts, I don't know. The ones in the um, residence, the wolf actually was the left and right mandibles that came that were together in a context. So this is the, they were obviously articulated and maybe were part of a, a, a skin. Um, so there's some neat stuff going on there. Um, I think even more remarkable is that early on I started noticing that there seemed to be a, a portion and side preference, especially among pigs, that where there was a predominance of a right-sided like forelimb bones, especially the ulna occurring in the residence, the more elite area, and the left-sided predominance in the workshop. And this is something that I thought was pretty exciting because people without expertise digging all over those, those across those five decades would never be able to create this pattern. You know, this is not like they, if you were just picking out large bones, and, you know, and that kind of thing, that would, that would be a pattern that humans could create. But someone without, without nobody would know what a left or right ulna looked like unless they had training. And so this is, this is an actually real pattern that's happening across the site. Um, excitingly, now that we can map it, because there's enough data in open context, so this is the residence, and this is the workshop. And um, with this, we're looking now at the right ulna. So you can see that there are right ulnas in both areas, um, but when you look at the left, you see that there is almost all the lefts are occurring in the workshop area. And this is about 178, yeah, data records. So it's a pretty big sample. Um, we also see some differences in rights and lefts from, with the wild animals occurring in these two areas. Same thing, with more lefts in the workshop and more rights in the residence. And so whether this is something, you know, that this is, were they doing carcass distribution? You know, whether was there a market? Um, clearly there was some selection of the right side that was going into the residence area. For what reason? I can't say, but um, this wasn't just, this wasn't just random you know, distribution of, of carcasses across the site. They were halved and then one half was going one place and another half was going the other place. So there was prior analysis on this assemblage. This is Mike McKinnon, who is a um, Canadian archeologist who's worked all over Italy and elsewhere. And um, he had come to Merlot um, early on, uh, not early on, 
early on in my time, a few years before I did, and he had looked at just maybe a thousand bones really quickly just to give him an idea of what they had. And so I thought it would be really nice to be able to incorporate his analysis into this because it's nicer to have, you know, two, al two analysts I think are better than just one because we can provide some checks and balances to each other. So um, I contacted him and he was able to actually provide his um, data to me, which was in like written little uh, tables and he transcribed them for me or he um, digitized them and sent them. So here's just an example of our differences. This is one context. And we could see from comparing our, our uh, identifications, I, I got the bones and I, I identified them as well. And so he was over identifying cattle um, and I was putting them more into large mammal. We both had dog, we both had tortoise, we both had bird. He had more pigs than I did. And then um, he put sheep and goat into sheep goat. And I actually split out my sheep. So these are not huge differences. Um, what it showed is that, that we have an over-representation over of cattle and pigs. And I think one of the things that, um, and an under-representation of deer, and it's because Mike wasn't at the site for very long, because I've been there eight years, I now understand that there's these really large red deer at the site. But it took time, like looking at the assemblage to see this, and I just clustered them into large mammal, whereas he put them in cattle. So it's just something about once you have more time and expertise with the collection, you start to see these kinds of differences. But for we did a joint publication on it, and it was really good for us to know these differences. In particular, like um, he was counting loose teeth. This is why he had more pigs than I did. He counted every single loose tooth as a separate specimen, whereas I put more time into trying to put jaws back together. And there were lots of things that belong to the same jaw that clearly came from one animal. But again, it's just that the expedience that he was there for a short time and he just wanted to give them a little overview. Mm -hmm. So, but this is good to know when we're putting data together. Um, more recently, I, we sort of formalized this with um, Hannah Lau, who um, worked on the same assemblage that I did in Turkey. So for 15 years, I was involved in, involved in an excavation in Turkey called Domuz Tepe, which is in southeastern uh, Turkey. And um, it's a late Neolithic Halaf site. And I analyzed probably more than 10,000 bones from the site. And then she came in. There were a lot more left. She wanted to do her PhD. And so she analyzed another 10,000 bones. And I wanted her to be able to use my data so that she could have a larger um, assemblage to work with. But we had this issue again of inter-analyst variation. And how do you actually combine data analyzed by two different people? And so she undertook a study where um, she uh, found some bones that neither of us had analyzed from the site and she brought me down to LA and we both analyzed the same um, assemblage and then we compared our results. And um, in the end we realized that um, uh, we had about a 6% error rate where we actually identified things totally differently from each other and then about a 20% rate of, of sort of uh, Basically, basically uh, the precision of our identifications. So I would be more precise in saying, oh, this is a sheep, and she would say it's a sheep or goat, or, or she would say it's a medium-sized mammal or something like that. So because of her, she had less experience with the, the, um, with the zooarchaeology in general, I guess she was being a little more careful about, about that, which is fine. Um, so this study highlighted the need to be explicit and transparent in our analysis. We um, ended up recommending that projects make time for small inner analyst studies like this as a way to identify inter-analyst variation in their data. Researchers routinely calibrate their scientific instruments to gauge accuracy and measurement, but we largely don't do that, this in zooarchaeology, um, as we typically don't calibrate our, our identifications of specimens. Um, we also discussed uh, issues of data documentation, and we encourage the writing of a paradata document uh, to accompany a data set which describes in detail the context, the analysis, the methods used, and any other information that will help a future user understand that data set better. And this adds more time to our work, but it's critically important for reuse. We kind of see it as like, what if the whole excavation team was abducted by aliens? <laughs> what would be left? Like, and how would we understand what they'd collected, the data they collected, and how they were doing their analysis, because they're gone. I mean, someday we're all gonna be gone and our data will be left. And how will other people use our data? I'm hopefully not abducted by aliens. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm gonna skip through this study because I'm running out of time. It sort of said the same type of thing. Just to highlight that, we did a, a study where we produced a paradata document um, with some other colleagues, Levin Atichu and Justin Lefto, we're using an old data set, uh, like uh, an orphan data set that had never been analyzed. We produced a three-page document that explains stuff like, um, you know, that we, uh, 
you can't read this at all anyway, that we basically took out certain bones because because of this and that and that reason. We combined these two categories for this and this reason. So we basically justified our lumping and splitting decisions. It, and it took lots and lots of documentation. This is something you could never share in a regular publication. No one would ever know the choices you made. Um, and so it makes your data not reusable. Furthermore, when we um, communicate our data, we usually do it in summary tables. And so no one can use that at all. I mean, there's no way you can go back and, and use any kind of data from that. It's just to present the study being done. So if you could point back to the primary data set and describe how you got to these numbers, it would make for much more reproducible and, and transparent research. Uh, and that study was published, sorry, in the journal of uh, Archaeological Method and Theory that you can go see. And then we did a, we actually analyzed the data set, the old orphan data set, and came up with some research results. So we also undertook a um, study, which I actually, I think we reported on this in a talk we gave here at ARF a few years ago. Um, that was a large-scale data sharing and integration project that explored the origins of farming. And this was funded by the Encyclopedia of Life and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we brought a bunch of zooarchaeologists working in Turkey together to try to integrate their data sets and so that we could observe where the challenges were with data integration. And essentially, um, what happened is that um, we had some fields that were really easy to align and then fields that were really hard to align. And the ones that were difficult to align were actually quite surprising. Um, so things like measurements, toothware, and fusion data are, are things that as a zooarchaeologist, you would think would be pretty standardized, that people would collect similar information. But what happened was people, for instance, everyone used the von de Angela von der Driesch's guide to measuring animal bones. That was just sort of the standard everyone had over time adopted for um, reporting measurements, but it was in the way that they modeled their data that it became really difficult. Everyone used Excel, nobody used a database. So we all had our spreadsheets modeled differently. And so someone would have uh, you know, the element listed and then a whole bunch, all von Hendrich's measurement possibilities as field headers and then they plug in the measurements along the way that applied to that bone. Some people would put a field that said measurement one and then they'd list the name of the measurement and then next to that put the measurement. So those kinds of things are incredibly hard to link up across spreadsheets without like remodeling the entire spreadsheet. So in the end we actually, even though this is like maybe the most standard that Zoark recording gets, that was something that hung us up in terms of our comparability of the, assembl of the assemblages. Toothware had a similar problem where um, everyone followed this recording strategy that's proposed by Sebastian Payne for sheep and goat teeth. It's widely used, but again, the vast differences in how different people modeled and recorded that data made it just totally unmeshable. So, and the same thing happened with fusion data, where people use standard terms, but then they'd add on little notes and stuff that, that made it really difficult to tell um, without just glomming them all into like really broad categories. So basically this under the hood exposure um, helped us lead to better data documentation practices that we realized that we saw each other's data and went, oh my gosh, you know, our data can never be compared and maybe I should start doing something more like yours or, you know, people, people had no idea, they had never looked at each other's data sets and seeing how other people had modeled their data. So this is really informative and I hope it will move us toward improving our collection practices. So finally, just to conclude, um, our current project now is called the Secret Life of Data Project and it is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and it's a three year project that is um, basically going out to th um, four different excavation sites across the world and doing um, ethnographic and uh, field and uh, um, um, interviews and that kind of thing to try to collect information on how um, issues in the, cre in the creation of data are, down are impacting the reuse of data downstream. So it's a combination of interviews, um, field observations, reuser interviews of, of data reusers that aren't part of the projects, and then analysis of the databases that these, these excavations are creating. And what we're trying to do is improve this area where <laughs> data creation has, is, really does not overlap much at all with data reuse. And so there's a very small area where, where they have um, commonalities. So our observation in, in interviews on um, this, these projects indicated that there were no clear guidelines for how specialists should integrate their data sets with the project database. 
Specialist analysis often occurs over several years, as I said, and, off, and in off-site locations. Um, and thus, specialist studies and data sets are commonly siloed, bodies of inconsistently managed data and documentation. The siloing often divorces zooarchaeological data, for instance, from excavation context and impedes interpretation. So greater, profession, greater professionalism within project data management may include the project's um, expectations for sharing data within and outside of the project, a timeline for specialists to complete their analysis, and plans for any data or conventional publications based on the data um, from the project. And from this study, we're also recommending that projects discuss how to integrate specialist data with the primary excavation, excavation data set, which includes conversations about how to, how to give faunal specimens unique numbers that make sense within the broader project, for example, uh, file formats to be used, detailed documentation about paradata, um, such as sampling strategies and identification methods, and data archiving and preservation plans. So that is, we generally need to improve communications between specialists and other project participants so that specialist data contributions um, more meaningfully um, contribute to a broader understanding. So this work is continuing. We're just finishing our field observations um, like this fall. And um, then we're finishing up uh, reuser interviews. And so, um, we're continuing also to explore the importance of consistency and um, identifier management. And this also comes from our work with Open Context where um, we get a lot of data sets that have no identifiers that are unique. And so someone will give us a spreadsheet and they'll have a whole bunch of data in it, but when you go to try to work with it and sort it, you realize that there are overlapping specimens, there's things, there are just no identifiers that, that identify each individual item. And this could lead to a lot of confusion in the future with, with data reuse. Um, but our, our research is also showing that data management not, is not just a technical um, concern, that it involves humans who are involved in all aspects of archaeological data documentation and reuse. And so it's important to keep talking to people and not just focus simply on what technology solution is going gonna, is gonna to work here. Now, oh, and then finally, uh, we have a cat. <laughs> and, we go away for a month every summer, and so a lot of people like to conclude with pictures of sunsets or animals. So this is Spooky, and he needs someone to live with him a month every summer. And we live in North Berkeley, so if any of you are interested in house sitting in June, July time, uh, come talk to me. He's lovely, very fluffy. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Five minutes, right? Two, two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> June. Hey, man. Wow. Um, there's just so many things to hit on this that I would love to. We're going to go talk about We'll go for coffee. Sure. But for the first question, which is the one you brought up really early, um, about the incentivizing of this, right? Like trying, you know, scumballs like me trying to get tenure, right? Trying to figure out. Where, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> keep the house. Uh, but trying to figure out how this, like, how's that working for folks publishing as, you know, like yes. putting it in their tenure. I would love to know this. So now that yeah. you have tenure yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you are on those committees, well, no, really, so it's on people who are on those committees. Yeah, yeah. And also, if the people who are going up for it have enough guts to ask for it, yeah, yeah. Um, it's on work outside of the space. So I, you know, this is not, I would like to encourage this, but I realize it's very hard to change uh, systems that are kind of set. Um, but yeah, we have some colleagues who have said, I really fought hard for my digital contributions to be acknowledged, and I got totally shot down. Or I fought really hard for it, and they actually changed. So it takes sticking your neck out and trying, but that's terrifying, right, when you're, going, when you're trying to get promoted, which is why I think if the people who have been promoted and are now doing the review, if they could start to think more about how are we going to value these things and assess them, that would be amazing, so. See, that's the kind of thing, right? <laughs> like, we're doing the thing now where we're trying to figure out how does your community need scholarship yeah. be made legible, like what are the things you say when yeah. you're coming up, you know, those are documents yeah. that are being crafted by groups of scholars, so maybe there's... Yeah, so like Archaeological Institute of America has yeah. is coming up with the recommendations for this. I think uh, Historical Society, H, whatever, they came up with... There, there are definitely guidelines out there, and it needs to be for the people bringing forth their work, but also for the people who 
are reviewing it who maybe have no idea how to review this stuff. So I, I wonder if that's part of it is that people look at it and go, I don't know how to review this. And so, pff, you know, forget it. So if we, there are people had tools to actually real, you know, understand how to assess the quality of these contributions, that would help. So yeah, we need more guidance. Articles to have out in American Antiquity and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, as part of this last project, we hope to come out with some guidelines like that for, you know, different people at, people at different stages. Um, to be able to assess uh, digital contributions. It seems like the best stepping point for that is, you know, with places like the SAA and the AAAs and the AAs having recommendations for how you should deal with that yeah. alongside the NSF and the NEH mm -hmm. having yeah. a necessity that you have to deal with it. I mean, that should be a stepping off point right there for. Exactly. So I agree. That that value the SAA that should have a committee. Absolutely. That this gets fed into, so yep. they're all speaking the same language. So, you know, so this is this required is, for so you to have a grant, right. and having a grant is part of your tenure package. Right. Then. So you yeah. need to have and also, something, a systematic way to do it. So it's well, and the people reviewing those grants also need tools for how to review those things. Like I think data management plans, as far as I understand it, and the ones I've seen as a reviewer, are all over the place. You know, <laughs> And how are you supposed to know how to assess those right. if you don't have any experience with it? And so it would be nice if there were examples of, I mean, they're going to be diverse because every project is really diverse, but there have got to be some baselines that, you know, you're not going to, um, oh, data management is not putting it in my file cabinet. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, there's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm wondering about, you guys presumably have metrics on how much visitation oh. use your site is getting, and, um, and I'm wondering if the, granular nature of the open context approach, is it showing more use than, say, the, the, the um, grouping of other Like just, like just big files, yeah. yeah. Um, so one issue is that we don't track use metrics because we don't want, we want to keep people's, um, people anonymous, their use anonymous, so we are not following users like that. Um, we go through like Google Scholar citations, so if you, search for open context in Google Scholar, you can see how many places are actually citing things from open context. But we, I, we haven't looked at it in terms of like individual items or whole projects yet, but that's a good idea to see if, if people are more interested in sort of this granular citation rather than um, well, projects as a whole. So that's the kind of information that can be fed to the committees and the mm -hmm. committees if you say, you know, what's, what's happening. Right. <laughs> And I think maybe the digital data management uh, interest group of the SAA probably needs to get its organized to take a, a, um, a request to the SAA board, for example. They're I in think, the setting yeah, up it's task, a good idea. Ta task forces. All the time. Oh, I've, yeah. I've never seen them. <laughs> I've never seen them. <laughs> a task force to assess the task force. Have, they have, they have to set up a task force this week and one next week and one next week. Requesting a task force to start looking at it because I think where we are is at a transitional period. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just mm -hmm. talking to somebody on the phone this morning about an evaluation of somebody for a major deanship, you know, an archaeologist. Yeah, and you know, <coughs> why would an archaeologist be a good person to have as a dean? Mm -hmm. You know, beside our multidisciplinarity and uh, having people of our generations actually and even the younger generations be the ones that actually says. The field is changing. Mm -hmm. Evaluation is changing. Personnel cases are changing. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've got to, you know, sort of get people in there. For that, right. right. Yeah. Definitely. But it is. A I think it's a transitional place, and so we're still sort of one foot in the old, and some people are getting one foot in the new. I think so too, and I think there's a value to like both the carrots and the sticks. So like the stick right. of the NSF saying you have to have data management has made people wake up and go, oh. I have to start thinking about my data, which is why we've seen an uptake in the people coming to us with actual funding, because it's finally starting to happen. Like that requirement came into place and it took a few years, and now they're like, okay, I'm ready, and I've got $1,000 or whatever. But the carrot of like having, here are your metrics, is a great, you know, that's a great incentive to why, why put your data up there. Well, it's because look at all these people that are using it, and yeah, and then you can report that. Well, I think so we'll look into that. Well, an interesting uh, issue to bring up in a couple weeks when we have Franz Cordova, the head of the yes. here. To talk about broader impact because this is broader it's, it's, impact. It is a broader impact. Right. It is broader yeah. than that. So their, their notion of having broader impact and data management are not separate at yeah. all. Yeah. You know? And so you know that that's where 
people right. can fulfill both of those um, if, they're, if they're smart enough. Mm -hmm. And then you don't, I mean, like the podcasts and stuff, you don't know even how broad that impact is. It's right. out there and it's being used <laughs> and it's great, but you, it's hard to, it's hard to measure. That's even the new uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I really enjoy your discussion on some of the issues with data collection, especially in terms of like, discrepancies between people collecting the same data. Uh, and I especially like your uh, comment on the calibration of uh, techniques of data collection, for example. And I was wondering if you think there's something more particular to smart quality, given that you. Uh, you focus on many species, uh, as remember, for example, in archaeology. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder if, if this is something that is specific to that, or if uh, archaeology, for example, should also focus on calibrating techniques, for example, in when looking at specific population in terms of uh, biological sex, mm -hmm. age, or other uh, items in biological profile, and um, how they. I think it's easier for zooarchaeology because we have more, you know, we have a taxonomy that, and it's Latin names for a species and everyone uses them. That's, that's really easy. You don't have that in ceramics, <laughs> you know, or other fields, lithics. Um, but so it's really good to use archaeology as, as, as a start to see how we might do this. But I think, um, like, for instance, if you work in someone's lab and you learn their technique of analyzing lithics, you've calibrated with them, right? Because you've trained with them, but those approaches aren't necessarily formalized. And so maybe they've published papers and stuff, but there's no sort of standard that they've published that people can turn to. Part of that is that people hate standards sometimes and no one wants to like adhere to someone else's. But if we, if we start to share those more formally, I think we will start to converge on good approaches and it, but it takes opening up the hood and looking under and seeing all the mess. And that's really hard to share. It's hard to do that to be with your colleagues. Um, and then seeing what emerges as best practices. Share your mess, open your underwear drawer. <laughs> Sorry. I was curious of uh, any examples of archaeobotanical data published in your uh, open source. So we don't have any there right now, but we have two in the like pipeline that aren't ready yet. So they will be coming. But it's a hard one. I mean, maybe, tell, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, what it, the way that you report your data is um, in these sort of more summaries type tables, right? I mean, that's how you have to do it, right? By bag or whatever. Yeah. Raw data is an appendix. Okay, but it's, what I mean is you're doing it by um, percentage, right? Uh, in, in a sample, so it's not, it's not individual item by individual item. So it's a little bit of a difference. Okay. <laughs> well, I think you mentioned- It's never raw. Uh, right. You mentioned okay. Claire Ma Madison uh -huh. in Giza, and I think she's gonna enter like the different species of plant types she has. Yes, I just cleaned her data, and oh. it was very clean. And she did that. She entered the different species. We've linked them all now to a like species list in the web, and hopefully people can start linking across projects now. I didn't get into that today, but um, the whole idea of linked open data is how we try to get data out of them in context and to yeah. find related data across the web. So yeah, her stuff will be coming really soon. Like it's ready to go. So because yeah. I would love to see examples before like other people oh, okay. participate. So you want to you, you can email me if you want to so I can let you know and you can maybe look at it. Give us feedback <laughs> if you want to have a look and because we always appreciate what people, you know, have to say about how the data looks and how we can improve it. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a question or are you? I did have a question. Um, I think you might have answered it a little bit about cataloging standards, um, especially in terms of trying to do cross site analysis and thinking about the variety of ways that people catalog products so mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, do you provide any sort of standards? Do you have anything like outlines for how people upload the data? Or do you like, provide? Any sort of so yeah, only if they've given it to us, like for that, so for that Chinese petrography um, database that's coming up now, um, we're, just, we're just putting it online now. He provided a, a, a catalog, I mean a um, template for how people should submit their data. Um, we would like people to share their like ontologies of their naming systems so that 
when you publish them in a place like Open Context, it makes them more formal. And so someone can say, I'm using so-and-so's ontology. Here's what I mean when I say black top burnish wear or whatever, so, you know, some kind of terminology. So it makes it more formal. Um, but no, that's coming. That's sort of going to happen as people submit their data. We have one project that is looking at, um, it's Kate Brunson, who's at Harvard, I think. She's looking at Chinese oracle bones. And she is she's also published her system for zoning the bones. So like a scapula would have all these different zones, and that way she can say exactly where the markings, the burnings, and the drillings and stuff are happening on these oracle bones. And um, she, that's in Chinese and English. And so someone can talk about this marking is on zone D, and it's this kind of marking. She's given a, a authoritative page that describes that zone and that type of marking, which is really cool because it means she's helping sort of develop the standard that could be used by others. So that's the way that we're hoping that'll happen. But we don't have any library of those things yet, unfortunately. I'm thinking about that is the database that I use is um, the digital archive, the digital archaeological archive Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. And they're actively working to create those yeah. sort of standards for material culture analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's DAC's approach, right? Is that you re you recatalog? Yeah. So, but for instance, their approach, like we we actually are have some collaborative work going on with them, and we we're hoping that you know we could like pull in their approach or whatever, point to it as one of the resources you know that people could use. So, um, yeah. But that's another approach of integrating content that is related across an area that you can kind of draw a line around, right? So, um, but it wouldn't work for all lithic specialists, say, across the world, because um, it's too diverse. Anyway, stop. Right. Thanks for Thank staying. <laughs>